that kind of looks like the exam, like what you're actually going to have. So we have uh, four trend false questions that we're going to um, we're going to go through. And then we have like two big typical exercises. Uh, like you're probably going to have something that from that type. So it's going to be pretty useful for you to know how this goes. Um, OK, so Luca is going to take you through the first question. I think you guys can all read it. Can you guys read it all? All good? Yes. OK, okay great. So, OK, this is the first question. Suppose that X, Y is a point on the budget line and that the marginal rate of substitution at this point is equal to 3. If prices are price of X equal to 2 and price of Y equal to 1, then in order to increase its utility, the consumer should reduce the consumption of good X and increase the consumption of good Y. True or false? OK, so basically, guys, when we have this kind of exam, this kind of exercise, we go, what we got to know is that the utility of a consumer is basically maximized at the tangency condition. So basically, when we have a tangency condition between the marginal rate of substitution and basically the indifference curve, so our relationship between price of X and price of Y, in that moment, we are maximizing our utility. Oh, and by the way, I, I just went straight. Uh, I'm, my name is Luca and I am a second year BM and I was very concentrated on the exercise. <laughs> so. Luca loves micro. Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, my name is Samia. I'm also a second year BM student and like we'll take you through Sup these exercises. Super awkward conversation. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, anyway, so anything that you guys have to keep in account for this exercise is that uh, we maximize utility when this condition also. So when the marginal rate of substitution equals the ratio between price of X and price of Y. In this case, we know that marginal rate of substitution, we are told that it is equal to 3. While we know that price of X is equal to 2, price of Y is equal to 1. Therefore, uh, what we can notice is that our marginal rate of substitution, 3, is greater than 2 over 1. So the, the statement, guys, is false because in this case, in order to increase our utility, we should increase good X. We should not increase good Y because if we do increase good Y, our ratio is going to go down. And in no way we are going to be able to equalize the marginal rate of substitution. Instead, if we decide to increase X, let's say that we put X equal to 3, in that case, it's going to be 3 equal to 3 over 1, 3 equal to 3, and we are satisfied because we maximized our utility and we found our balancing condition. Okay, all good on this one? Do you have any questions for this exercise? This is very typical. In the first partial, nine times out of 10, this kind of exercise gets out, guys. So my advice is revise it because for how easy it can appear, it's always kind of tricky sometimes. Um, another advice that I give you is sometimes do pay attention on what kind of good you are dealing with and what kind of utility relationship you're dealing with, whether there are substitute goods, uh, complementary goods. In that case, just make sure that you are not just doing the P of X over P of Y, but you are applying uh, all the different scenarios of the case. All good? Think so. Okay, I'll take it as a yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's so, go with the next one. Okay. So the second one says, if X and Y are substitute goods, the elasticity of the demand for X with respect to the price of Y is negative. So, guys, I think you should like have seen this in class. But um, when two goods are substitutes. The, el the elasticity of demand for one good with respect to the price of another is always positive. So like since X and Y are substitutes, the elasticity is going to be positive. So for example, like to illustrate this in an exam, you can like explain that, uh, like you can say that if the price of Y goes down, 
than by the law of demand. The consumption of Y is going to go up, like price goes down, consumption is going to go up. And since X and Y are substitutes, the consumption of good X is going to go down. And like you can do the exact same reasoning if the price of Y goes up and if the price of X goes up or if the price of X goes down. So like it's very important in this kind of question to pay attention to the facts that the goods are substitutes. And uh, like this is very important. So if the goods are substitutes, the elasticity of one with respect to the price of the other is always going to be positive. So is that OK for everyone? OK, I think it's fine, guys. If you have any question, like don't hesitate to raise your hand or anything right in, right in the chat, like just let us know. Like these are very, very typical exercises, so it's really important that you know how to do them. OK, I'm taking over the next one. Do you guys see it? Yes. So OK, I'm going to. Yeah, do you have any? Is there any question here? I think she said they, wish they could see the... Okay, the okay, stuff. nice, nice. Or, so, if a production function exhibits increasing returns to scale, the long-run marginal cost curve is going to be below the long-run average cost curve. So, you know, increasing returns to scale is basically that uh, the more we produce, the more our costs are going to go down. When we produce more, our costs are going to be reduced, okay? This is the main idea of uh, an increasing return to scale. So actually, this statement gets to be true. And the reason why basically you guys have to keep in mind that uh, it gets to be true is that a firm that is exhibiting like increasing returns to scale, it means that anytime we put an additional uh, required input, so basically anytime I put one more input, To guarantee one more output. It means that basically our marginal cost is going to decrease. Like anytime I do apply this process, I produce one more, and uh, at the same time, I try to increase my, I, I try to reduce my marginal cost. So increasing return to scale, it means that our marginal cost is going to go down. Our long run average cost is going to be up. It's going to be the same, basically. So let's say that we are imagining it through a graph. And if we have like any kind of a production function, let's say that now I'm just going to imagine this is our MC and this is our AC. And this is the production function, let's say, what are we imagining is that AC stays the same because we're not changing it. But in the, what we're changing is our marginal cost because any time that I'm basically applying a new input to my production, if I am guaranteeing an increasing return to scale, my marginal cost is going to decrease. So by decreasing and decreasing, what we have is that where we are asked if the marginal cost is going to stay below at the same level or above the average cost curve. Well, in this case, it's going to stay below because I said, like, keep in mind that we have it when we have an increasing return. So is it clear to you guys? You can also react with emojis okay, if you want. Yeah. If you don't want to write on the chat, you can react. Yeah, you can react on the emoji. <laughs> Somebody said anything? Yeah. Okay, nice. That's nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're gonna. If everything is good, we're gonna go for the um, the other the last true and false. All right. So this one goes, Giovanni reacts to a, to a wage reduction with a reduction in the labor supply. 
This means that for him, leisure is necessarily an inferior good. Okay, so this is also a very typical question. So basically, what does the question tell us? It says that wage goes down. So Giovanni is going to like reduce his labor. And they say that this means that leisure is an inferior good. So like, that's what we're trying to see. So uh, basically, to answer this question, we're going to have to look at the income effect and the substitution effect. So first of all, we're going to look at the substitution effect for these two goods. So um, we see that wages go down. So what does this mean? What is the wage? So I think you should have seen in class that the wage is basically the opportunity cost of leisure. So since wages go down, uh, it means that leisure is going to go up. The consumption of leisure is going to go up because its price is like it's less expensive. And basically, since leisure goes up, it means that labor is going to go down because like you know that your time allocation is basically what you put in leisure and what you put in labor in work. It's so like that's the parenthesis. So that, that's what we see for the substitution effect. Now, if we look at the income effect, we have to see what type of good is leisure. So leisure can be either a normal good or an inferior good. So we're going to start by seeing if it's an inferior good. So if it's an inferior good, it means that Giovanni is basically poorer because uh, his wage reduced. So since his wage reduced, he's going to like, OK, Giovanni is relatively poor. So he's going to want more leisure. So like that's our first part. Our second part to look at this. Uh, is so if leisure is a normal good. So if it's a normal good, it means that. Leisure is going to go down and labor is going to go up the consumption. So basically, if we take all the information together, it's possible that um, this. So like what they're asking us is true, like we can see it here and here. But there is also another possibility that is that so first possibility. Leisure is an inferior good. Second possibility is the fact that leisure is a normal good. But the substitution effect is going to be bigger than the income effect. So that's another oops. That's another possibility of the exercise. So like this is not false, but this is only half true. So Very good. we should be good. Let us know if you have any questions for this exercise. I'm waiting for the emojis, guys. <laughs> this time we're going to get better. Emojis. Ah, oh. Nice. <laughs> Still good emojis. Still good Normally emojis. at this time of the lab, it all goes like bad. <laughs> all right. All right. So now we did the um, the two, the four true and false, and they're really all like typical, typical questions. It's yeah. like your first micro partial. Like these are really questions. You're at least gonna have like two of these. Kind of. It's like, These are gonna be extremely likely. Like. Yeah. So like, try your best to review those questions. Review the um, the team, the themes that are important in the question. So like, um, substitution effects, income effect, average cost, uh, elasticity of demand. Like all of these, try to have them clear in your head. So they're gonna come. For this one, guys, we were thinking that maybe we're gonna give you a few minutes so you can try to solve it yourself. And then at the end of the time, uh, we will solve it together so you can see how it works and you can try to apply your way of reasoning and solving it. And then once we're done, uh, we're going to start it over and I'm going to solve it all. OK, so just read it. I'm going to I'm going to read it for you. Uh, Daniele likes to consume a good C, 
and to enjoy leisure n. So it's a problem on good and leisure. His utility function is utility n c equal to n to third c one third. His time and domain amounts to 16 hours. So 16 hours is our total time that we can remember we allocate either to work or to leisure. The market wage rate, so how much this person gets paid for one hour of work, is 10, is 10 euro, let's say, per hour worked. But in addiction, Daniele receives a fixed rent of 20. So keep in mind you have 10 euro per each hour he works, plus he has a fixed income of 20. That is not directly related to the number of hours that he works, it's just an extra income he gets. So you guys have two questions. First one, assume that the price of consumed goods equals one. So, I mean, doesn't matter how much you consume in terms of goods, you're gonna spend one all the time. Write down Daniele budget constraint analytically and represent the budget constraint in a graph, highlighting slope and intercepts. Then also the marginal rate of substitution that you can remember from the first uh, true or false uh, that we did, you have to remember that equalize. It's equal to 2C over N. Compute the optimal levels of consumption, labor and leisure. Locate the solution in the graph above. At this point, just one extra scenario that you have to try to, to solve yourself. What happens to the optimal consumption bundle if the rent increases from 20 to 110? Explain. OK, so maybe we can we can give ourselves um, five. Yeah, five minutes to start with the point one. You can try to solve it yourself and then we go through it together. OK.
Okay, guys, so we're going to start solving the exercise. If you didn't have enough time like to finish, it's fine. We're going to explain everything in details. So okay. don't worry. So guys, first of all, what you have to consider is your... Can I mute his phone? I don't know. Okay, nice. <laughs> Okay, now anyway, what you have to consider is that first of all, you have to keep in mind your budget constraint. So in this case, Daniele's budget constraint, that is equal on a hand of the price of consumption good per consumption good. And on the other hand, it's going to be multiplied, it's going to be equal to the wage rate okay, that multiplies time endowment minus the number of leisure hours that we do dedicate to ourselves every day. In this case, you also have to keep in mind that you have a fixed rent, that is a fixed income that is completely independent from the wage logic. It's, I mean, you, you're going to get those money anyway. It doesn't matter whether you're going to have like uh, zero wage or 100,000 wage. That's just something's going to enter in, in your cash amount anytime. And if we have to translate it into numbers, it's going to become C, because remember the price of C is 1. So you're going to be 1 per C equal to C. And on the other side, we're going to be 10, our time endowment that is 16 minus N, the number of our, uh, <clears throat> of our leisure that we're going to imagine, plus 20. Therefore, it's going to be. Does it work to you guys? Do you understand how the how that works? So basically, when we add to graph, on this way we have consumption, and on this way we have n. So it's Straightforward, it's going to be 18, 0, and it's going to be the other end, 0, 180. Because let's suppose that um, uh, we have no leisure, basically. So it's going to be this one is going to be 10 per 0, and here I'm going to have the vertical intercept 180. Well, here is basically 180 over 10. Does it work? Does, does anybody have any question of like how we got the intercept? Oh, clearly, guys, I forgot. The slope is equal to uh, the wage rate minus the price of consumer good. And right now we are having a technical problem. OK. All good. So I was saying our slope is basically equal to our wage rate over our PC and it's going to be equal to minus 10. OK, you got it. Any question, any doubt? OK, then I think we can go on with point two. I'm going to give you five minutes to do point two as well.
Hi, uh, I have a question. Of course, tell us. Uh, the maximum amount of N shouldn't it be 16, like because T is 16 and we graph it or uh, we shouldn't graph it there. OK, so that's very true, like we're in an exercise where it like it's more like 18 is more than your time endowment. So like you should put 16 instead of 18. But like, yeah, mathematically it's 18, but in this case should be 16. Let me correct this. All right. Uh, for everyone who didn't get it, like even if uh, mathematically it's going to be 18, you know that so the um, if we go back to the exercise, we see that the maximum amount of time is 16. So like you cannot go above this, above this value. Uh, I meant um, oh. when n is 18, we uh, kind of grab a vertical line when n is 16. Oh. Sorry. Uh, uh, we left this 18 number in n. However, uh, when n is 16, we kind of uh, grab the vertical line and intersect, uh, it intersect this budget line and then the left side we i don't know how to explain it. okay uh can you be now because we hear you very disturbed so can you please type in the chat so oh, where is the chat i can find it oh yeah so nobody can see the chat no, it's not just us okay okay can you just repeat oh, yeah just just repeat and then is it about the y the x interception uh, okay, never mind. No, oh, go on. I mean, if you have a doubt, to try. We're, yeah, yeah, we're here like to help. We're here you. to help. Uh, the first, uh, like, uh, when we graphed, uh, n is 18. It interse intersect n when it's 18, like, uh, however, as uh, t is uh, 18, uh, 16 and n cannot be greater than t, then in our uh, like budget constraint, we should um, write like when n is 16, we uh, graph the horizontal line when n is 16 and when it uh, intersects the budget constraint, like it's the graph itself. I'm very, very sorry, I didn't understand your question. Okay. Uh, can I uh, turn my video? Of sure, course, of yeah, course. yeah, sure, sure. Uh, one second. Okay. Maybe I'm mistaken, but... Uh, when n is 16, we graph it like this, and then this is uh, we just remove okay, it. Okay, so the, this is our budget constraint. Yes, it is. The only thing is that um, when you graph it, in this case, you should have to graph the uh, total hour endowment. And in this moment, the total hour endowment is 16. So even though in this case, mathematically, it was going to be 18, once you graph, by the way, you, you guys are not going to be asked to graph in the exam. It's no way you're going to be asked to graph also because this is going to be a technological exam taken on, on online for respondents. Uh, so there's nothing you have to uh, draw. There's nothing you have to graph. So I'm going to just help you out on this. But anyway, when you draft your maximum uh, endowment for leisure, being the time endowment 16, you have to graph 16. 
Have I replied to your question? Yeah, okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, uh, do you guys need some more time for the the second part of the question, or should we correct it? Wait, let me see the emojis. <laughs> okay, send a smiley face for more time, like laughing face. Okay, I think we can correct it then. Let's go. Uh, so, oops, there you go. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna clean this up. All right. So, okay, pretty much what we have to do is like assume, okay, the marginal rate of substitution is equal to MRS. Equal to 2c n. So basically, we're going to write it this way 2c over n. Compute the optimal levels of consumption, labor, and leisure, and locate the solution in the graph above. So remember, I mean, I should have specified at the beginning, remember that your marginal rate of substitution is clearly equal to price of x over price of y, that in these cases are our two intercepts. So we know that in this case, we have on the other end price of x plus price of y per y that is equal to our total endowment. So basically what we gotta do is just bring this in these two these two indicators and we find out that two of C N is equal basically to 10, that is our wage rate. Okay. Then we bring this in in our uh, expression, the expression that we used at the beginning when we talk about the budget constraint, and we get that 10n plus c is equal to 180. Since we know, guys, that 2cn is equal to n, what we found out is that. 10n is equal to, to c, and we can substitute because we know that c is 180 minus n. Therefore, we found out that c is equal to 10n. Substituting, we found for the n equal to 360, n is equal to 12. Since n is equal to 12, labor is equal to 4. Labor is equal to 4 because we do remember you that the uh, time endowment is equal to 16. Clearly, time endowment 16 minus n equal to 12 leave, leave us with 4 of labor. Now, since we know that every hour of wage is paid 10, our um, consumer endowment is going to be 40. So the final answer is going to be n equal to 12, l is equal to 4, and the consumer good is equal to 40. Okay? Oh, and by the way, if you also want to represent this graphically, it's going to be this way, 180, 16, more or less, our endowment is going to place at this point. Here is our leisure, that is 12. Here is our um, consumption, that is 40. All good? Uh, guys, this kind of math stuff, like this kind of math question where you're going to have to solve for different variables, you're necessarily going to have it. So like if you want us to go over the math again, let us know, like we'll, we'll do it with more details again, again, like until everybody gets it. But like this math, 
really, really important that you know how to do it, how to solve it. How you to basically have it. to integrate on a hand the equalization between marginal rate of substitution and the two prices, and on the other hand, the budget constraint that you were already, already given at the beginning. Okay, uh, is everything okay with the math? Um, wouldn't C be 60? So yeah, yeah, I'm focusing that right now. I apologize, man. Okay, <laughs> so be 60, actually, yeah. So, yeah, this one is also 60. And can you repeat how you got to uh, 2C over N equals 10? Yeah, okay. So, if you want, guys, we're going to go over like the resolution of this again. I'm going to take a new page. Okay. So basically, the two things that you're going to need to have in your system, like we're going to do this. I don't know if you guys saw this before, but it's just like to show that you have two equations. So you need the MRS to be equal to P of X over P of Y. And you need P of X times X plus P of Y times Y to be equal to your income, basically. So like, this is the basic equation. So if we substitute with the values that we have with the exercise, oops, sorry guys, just a sec. Little technical problem. Okay, you should be able to see my screen again. Alright, so if we put the values of the exercise in this, we have that 2c over n is equal to p of x, which is 10, if I recall. Yeah. Perfect. So this is going to be 10, P of Y is 1. So like that's what you have for the first part. The other one is the same that we did to compute the graph, the second equation. So we just like basically take it and put it in the same way. Like this, this equation is equivalent to saying that 10 N plus C is equal to 180. Okay, so now if we continue solving this. Uh, guys, just like so you know, I'm doing like this is one, this is two, this is three, like for the order in case you need to watch it again. Okay, so since we have this, you know, like you just do to see, it's going to be equal to 10n. And like you keep this for now. Okay, then if we continue. Okay, so what are we going to do now? Okay, so if we take this equation here, you can see that you can like isolate the, isolate the C to have C equals 180 plus 10M. So this C, we're going to take it from here and put it uh, in the other equation, so here. So I'm just going to write it the other way. So 10N is going to be equal to 2. And like instead of this C here, we basically put this value here, 180 plus 10N. Uh, minus 10N. Oops. Okay, so if we continue here, it's going to give us 10n is equal to 2 times 180, so 360, minus 2 times negative uh, 10n, so negative 20n. And we still keep this one here, so c equals 180 minus 10n. So if we solve this here, 
like if we pay attention to this part of the equation, we're going to get 30n is going to be equal to 360. We keep this one, oops, c equals 180 minus 10n. I'm really like detailing everything, but it's super important that you guys know how to do this. Uh, okay, so now to solve for n, we have n equals 360 divided by 30, which gives us 12. And we take this value of n that we just find here, so like 180 minus 10 times 12, which in the end is going to give us n equals 12 and c equals 60. So like that's the values you take. You get you get the n, you get the c from here. And for uh, leisure, you just put like that your equilibrium value of leisure is going to be your time endowment minus the time you spend in leisure. So 16 minus 12, and it's going to be 4. So let us know if you got everything. You guys good? You guys good? Okay, nice. Oh, you can. Okay, I can use that one. You want a new? Okay. okay, so we're going through real quick with uh, number three. Just a couple of minutes so you guys can see how to solve it, and then we will go through it very, very quickly. Okay, guys, so we're going to solve the third question now. Okay. So. Hold on. How are you doing? Sorry. Okay, now. I'm going to go straight here. So basically, what does the first question says? Okay, you're good. OK, um, what happens to the optimal consumption bundle if the rent increases from 20 to 110? Explain. So basically, guys, what you should do, like the first thing that you should do in this case is you do rewrite your consumption bundle. Remember that the components of the consumption bundle are those that we previously stated. So we have consumption on one side and then on the other side we have the rent and the equation between the um, wage rate, time endowment, uh, and number of leisure hours. So consumption is going to be equal, time endowment is going to be equal as well, because we have 160 that we get there, minus 10n, because you have to imagine that our w is equal to 10, but we have a new rent. The new rent in this case is 110. So our final consumption budget endowment is this one. 
Are you guys all good so far? Okay, so now we do the same reasoning that actually Samia did in the earlier point of the exercise. So we do our two equations. This is the first equation. The second equation is our budget constraint. And we easily find the value of our N. So basically what we do so far is we know that 2C is equal to 10N, therefore C is equal to 5N. We substitute 5N for C and we find 5N is equal to 270 minus 10N. Go on with the solution, 15N, because they move it on the other side, equal to 270. N is equal, if I'm not wrong with the math, to 18. So we know that N is equal to 18. Consumption is equal to 90. Now, what we notice, we notice that we knew that our time endowment was equal to 16 guys. With this new income that we have, we would be able to, to enjoy 18 hours of leisure. Therefore, we notice that our number of hours of leisure is greater than our time endowment. Our working hours is equal to zero. And the conclusion is that if the um, if Danielis gets 110 in rent, he would be able not to work and at the same time to enjoy a better lifestyle, not having any any wage time and any working hour because he would spend all the time in just leisure. Does it work to you? It's a boundary solution, basically. It's a boundary solution. Yeah. So you get zero on a part and the maximum on the other, or the maximum endowment on the other. And that was actually, it does reconnect to what we did at the beginning when we stated 18 on the X intercept. Keep in mind that in the case mathematical is 18. If you ever be called, you want to be honest, but if you ever be called graphing uh, a graph, you will have to state 16 because 16 is your maximal endowment. All clear? Okay, if everything okay. is good, we're going to go for our last exercise. Okay. So, um, we're going to give you like two minutes per question to see like if you guys want to try them first. Uh, consider the following production function. So like this is, you have it here. Uh, the cost of capital, I'm just like writing the values, R is equal to two. The cost of labor is equal to eight. Uh, does the production function exhibit increasing, decreasing, or constant returns to scale? So, like, this is a question you should answer really, really fast in an exam. So, this is going to be very likely to be a true or false uh, question that you might find. Yeah. So, like, think about it for a few, like, a few seconds and. I'll tell you how to solve it. All right. So basically, if we write our production function, oops. so if you say this, it's basically the same as if you had it written like this. So these are ones, excuse my writing. One and one. So uh, basically this production function is a basic of the glass um, production function. And you guys know that in a cup de glass uh, production function, you have, if you're, you know, this is alpha, this is beta, like alpha beta. If you have alpha plus beta is equal one, you have constant returns to scale. If it's greater than one, you have increasing returns to scale. If it's lower than one, decreasing the returns. Decrease. Okay, perfect. So here, based on the function, we can see that our alpha is equal to one. Our beta is also equal to one. So like alpha plus beta is equal to two. 
and we're going to have increasing returns to scale. Is everything OK for this question? Thumbs up if it's OK. Send some emojis. OK. <laughs> nice. I like the emojis. <laughs> OK, nice. Let's change a bit with the emojis. Let's try new emojis. There's not that many. No, yeah, there's not much choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sad. <laughs> OK, so we're going to go with the. Second part of the Second question. Point. OK, we're going to give you some time guys to do it. Yeah, it's just like. Oops. OK, suppose that in the long in the short run, sorry, K equals one. Compute the cost of producing Q equals 50 units in the short run. So like we'll give you five minutes to try to solve this, then we go through it together.
Okay, guys, we're going to solve the second question now. So uh, we're, I'm going to just write again the production function. So. Okay, so Q is equal to two. Okay. Uh, in the exercise, they want to produce 50 units. So like we have 50 equals two and we know that K is equal to one. So very tough math here, guys. Um, we're going to have to solve this. L is going to be equal to 50 divided by two, which is 25. Uh, also, I don't think it's asked in the question, but what they can ask you in the exam is to compute the total cost of uh, this production. So like, if we write the values again, we have R equal to 2, W equal to 8, and here K equal to 1. Uh, so we know that to compute the total cost, you have to use this. So like capital, uh, cost of capital, labor, cost of labor, just so you guys know what these values are. So we have eight times 25 plus two times one. So it's gonna be 200 plus two. So your total cost is gonna be 202. So like this wasn't asked in the question, but they can ask you in the exam just so you know how to do it with like this. From our personal experience, the two kind of exercises that are most likely to get out, one is going to be like either the one we did on leisure and consumption or also the one about, you know, savers and borrowers uh, and the budget constraint about saving and borrowing. That is also very important, guys. So I also, I mean, even though I do remember that in the book there was there were not many exercises about that, we still uh, advise you to do with that, like to go through those because it can happen that they get out, and if they get out, it's way better to be prepared about those. And another exercise like this one that Sami is doing, it is also very likely to get out. So it's going to be either on classical labor and capital or another one on marginal rate of substitution, but those are pretty easy because they are the beginning exercises. So yeah, you can expect them to get out, but don't be that sure. It's way likely to get out, like you have any kind of example, like an exercise like this one that we are solving so far. So focus on those. Okay, so do you guys have any question on this particular question? Um, All good. No. All good. Perfect. We are giving a thumbs up. I don't know what happened to the chat. Like, there is no chat. No, it's. We're using good. emojis now. <laughs> Let's communicate. If you have any questions, just like. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna read the third question. So you guys can like go through it for a bit, and then, as usual, I'm gonna solve it. So, given the MRTS, compute. Uh, the optimal long run choice of labor and capital in order to produce 50 units and compute the total long run costs. Okay, so I'm going to keep the exercise here so you guys can see the values and in like five minutes we're going to solve it.
All right, guys, so we're going to solve this question now. So I just wrote here the most important like data from the exercise. So basically, um, to go over an, a question like this, it's the same reasoning that we did before, but instead of the MRS, you have the MRTS. But mathematically, like it's the same thing to do. So um, I'm just going to write it like I did before. You have your MRTS, which here is K over L. That has to be equal to the W over R. And on the other on the other side, you put your production function. So Q equals to LK. OK, so now if we substitute this with um, the values of the exercise, so the ones that I put just above and like this, and this, uh, we have that K over L is equal to 8 over 2. So the values are from here and here, just to remind you guys. And uh, we want to produce Q equal 50. So we put 50 here is equal to 2 LK. So now if we continue solving this, we have that 2K is equal to 8L, uh, like just so you know, like you just multiply this, you multiply this, you get this. Um, and we keep this one, the same, so 50 equals 2LK. So if we continue, we have that, like, for example, let's say that we want to isolate K. So we put K alone on the left side and we get that K is equal to 8L over 2. We keep this one. OK. Uh, so this gives us K is equal to 4L. And uh, now with this, we can substitute the K here. So basically, we get 50 is equal to 2L times 4L. All right. So we keep going we get so we keep the first equation the same k is equal to 4l because now we're working with the second one and you get 50 is equal to 8 l square so don't be scared by the by this it will go very fast so we get k is equal to 4l and we're going to get that l square is going to be equal to 50 over 8. From this, we get this still doesn't change. And this, if the math is right, should be 6.25. So if we substitute the values in the end, we get that L is going to be equal to the square root. So I'm just writing it here. 625 and this should be equal to 2.5 and our uh, l is going to be four times 2.5 which should be let me check no i know okay should be 10 no yeah all right, so like, let me just add a page. OK, so uh, the values that we get in the end are going to be this. And if we want to compute the total cost, so we're going to do the same as we did before. So this is going to be W times L plus R times K. And this is going to be equal to 8 times 2.5 that we just figured out thanks to this basically plus r which is 2 times k which we just find out it's found out it's 10. so in the end you do the math and you get that the total cost is going to be 14. so uh, that's how you should go to solve this exercise um, if I have, let me know if there's any question. If I have one tip is that, so basically during an exam, you have limited amount of time and you're stressed because it's an exam. 
So pay attention to the math, like detail everything. Like what I did in my exams, what like basically everybody does is that you need to detail, like even if it's you think it's dumb and you can just like go over stuff, don't. Cause like it's really, really easy to make like dumb calculus mistakes when you're stressed. So I think you should like write everything, make yeah. sure that you go from one step to the other without making like any mistake, any calculus, like there's no calculus issues, then you should be fine. But just like pay attention, go slow, don't stress, it'll be well. Think be about it. <laughs> <laughs> and okay guys, so I hope that was useful. And just in case, should we leave our Instagram? So maybe they sure. contact us. <laughs> just in case you have any other note. And OK, remember, uh, last information that this is a partial. This means that it doesn't matter. I mean, try it. Doesn't matter how it goes. It can turn out fine. It can turn out that maybe you are not satisfied with your grade. Just try it because in case it doesn't work out or you're not satisfied, you can refuse your grade. So you decide not to go for the second partial, but you can go for the general instead. OK? So I hope that this was useful to you and uh, that's it. I and let us know if you have like any question now, like about how the exam goes, how the questions are, like if it's tough, yeah. if it, like let us know. We'll answer now, like any question that's not like totally micro related. I know the chat is not working, so. Oh, oh okay. lots of hearts. <laughs> that's so nice. <laughs> Okay, thank you guys. But thank you so much guys for attending. We yeah. really hope it was useful for you. And good luck with the exam. Yeah, good luck. And if you have anything, like you have our phone numbers, you have our Instagrams, don't hesitate to reach out. You have more information than we do of ourselves, so please go on <laughs> and text us. Okay. Have a great night, guys. See you everyone. In